All right, Raf Giallo here from Team 33 at the Cadbury Premier League launch. And who do we have here but Gary Neville of Sky Sports and also Manchester United legend. Welcome along to Dublin. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. I was going to start off by asking you about Dennis Irwin, but then they obviously announced the squads for the Liam Miller tribute match. And obviously you're going to be playing in it, Dennis Irwin's going to be playing in it, and the stellar cast of names. I think it maybe you'll be able to kind of tell us a little bit more, but it shows the standing that Liam Miller was held in both by you guys, Celtic and Ireland as well. What were your kind of standout memories of him as a player and teammate? Just being somebody who's a good teammate, a good person, uh, obviously a very good player. Um, and you know it was Roy who asked us to play uh, in the in the game. He asked me and Ryan in the summer when we was in the World Cup together, and never give it a moment's thought. I think it's really important that um, all the players you, know, you see the list that you know that's been put together and the players who are coming over to try and make sure that we do Liam justice um, because obviously it's tragic what's happened. Uh, and it's something that we you know, really need to make sure that we do the very best for him and come over and, 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 and give it our all. Yeah, and it'll be a great occasion as yeah. well. Um, obviously, I mentioned Dennis at the top there, uh, obviously a legend here. And you'd have seen him firsthand, 8 out of 10 performances at the very least yeah. every week. He was already at the club when you were coming through the youth ranks. Um, were you kind of looking at him as a kind of potential mentor as you were coming through? Or was it somebody you're just kind of watching from apart, afar and maybe just picking out attributes you might just add to your own game? Uh, naively, because I played centre-back in the youth team I was watching a lot more of Bruce and Pallister in my first two years at the club but then in the third year when Jim Ryan as a reserve team manager moved me to fullback I definitely at that point then started walking, uh, watching Dennis and Paul Parker yeah. um, Dennis is the best fullback that I've um, ever seen ever played with uh, absolutely incredible like I say just consistency of performance sometimes people say oh 7 or 8 out of 10 it wasn't it was 9 and 10 out of 10 He's that good, you know. His, his, his delivery of passes into the front, his, his understanding of his position, his, his uh, supporting of the attack, um, his, his ability to defend one on one, everything that you would need as a fullback, the, the ability to take a dead ball kick and free kick. Uh, it was absolutely brilliant player, um, and like I say, the best fullback that I've ever played with. So it was really a little bit later, after mm. my first two years, when I realised that maybe I wasn't going to play all the games at centre back that I really truly started to watch what he did, how he did it, uh, how he delivered his passes into the front. And one of the things I used to do quite a bit, and Dennis was brilliant at it, one of the things I used to do quite a bit was the opposite of what Dennis did, was I used to, I used to telegraph my passes. Mm. I used to be able to, I used to sort of set up exactly where I was going to. Dennis used to have that disguise on his passes. He used to sort of threaten to play it wide, but then whip it into feet into the striker, or he threatened to play it into, and then open his body out, and he had really good disguise, and that was one of the things I really picked up off him and tried to learn, and never got anywhere near as good as him in terms of being able to do it, but I to a little bit more guile in my game in terms of how to play passes into the front players or into the wide player. Um, and it was really a big uh, learning curve to, to watch him. And then Paul Parker, from a different point of view, was more around the defensive, yeah. you know, the way in which he defended in a real sort of aggressive manner. Uh, so I tried to look at both of them, but Dennis certainly was a, a joy to watch. Yeah, and as a full back, obviously nowadays there's a lot more inverted wingers than there would have been maybe in the 90s and early 2000s. Obviously you have to adapt your game probably once Beckham moved on and then Ronaldo came in. Like, How did you tweak your game or what did you have to look at when playing behind both of those? There were big shifts, to be fair, during my career. Uh, in how the game evolved for full backs. First of all, I think when I first came in, it was more of a, you're almost like a third centre back. You defended a lot more, you certainly, you, you were there to support the attack rather than be the attack. Whereas I think partway through my career, it certainly became a lot more evident with the likes of Roberto Carlos, Cafu and others such as Dennis, that you had to be an attacking force and you had to start to contribute in the last third of the pitch and overlap and underlap and then start to put crosses in and do different things. Um, and then towards the latter part of my career, it completely transformed again in the sense that you used to have a relationship with a right-sided player in front of you or a left-sided player if you were a left-back. All of a sudden players started shifting positions, moving into different areas, Ronaldo started switching wings and you ended up with somebody else there and it evolved again into sort of more of a fluid systems that we see now where you don't really have wide players anymore. Yeah. You have wide forwards who change, interchange, you make runs in. So the whole game has changed for full-backs in the last 20 years, probably three big shifts. Um, of how the game's played um, but you receive the ball a lot higher up the pitch now than you did maybe 20 years ago um, demands on the attacking side are a lot more uh, the energy levels have to be a lot higher you're like a wing back now as a full back yeah. people used to say that if you were an attacking full back you were a wing back now you have to be a you play in a back four and still be a wing back uh, in terms of the essence of how you have to be a forward and an attacker so it's um, no, it's, it's, it's changed a lot 
yeah. it's changed a lot. I was looking at some YouTube footage of, I think it was yourself and Paul Scholes doing media training when you were in the U team. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this clip at all, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, you might just tell us a little bit about that because I found Skulls quite funny, just kind yeah. of giggling away in the background. I don't know, I think it was you giggling maybe or somebody yeah. in the background. We're and all, we're all there. Yeah, and uh, aside from actually the media training thing, were you always conscious that maybe this was something that all players, yourself included, had to kind of develop as you were going into your pro careers? It, it was a good exercise really because the, the, the pressure, the, basically the, ex, the club recognised that to be a first team player wasn't just about being able to kick a football well. You know, it, it, many different things come with it, the commercial aspirations of the club and the charity things and the media com uh, commitments. So you have to be able to, you have to become competent at speaking to the media if you play for United. So they put us in an uncomfortable situation of having basically, it was uh, Key 103 at the time, the local radio station, got us into a room, but they had, I think the worst audience in the world is your teammates watching you actually do it you know so basically you can imagine that they were just what type of organization are you by the way off the ball are you can i say take the piss or or is it a bit of a kids thing what is this what is this all? oh is it all oh, right okay yeah well <laughs> anyway come on is it yeah so uh, you know uh, you're taking the mickey out of each other you take you know you're actually joking with each other all the time and skulls was on there we were all looking at him and sort of he didn't enjoy you could tell um but you, you realise that, you know, these sort of moments, getting comfortable, being in uncomfortable positions. As a kid, it's horrible being having a camera put in front of your face or having to speak in front of an audience. It's not a nice thing. It's not a nice thing for an adult to have to do, to be honest with you. So it's just something that you had to get comfortable with and, 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 and be good at, particularly if you're going to be a United player. I do remember the clips. Um, and we were obviously young, immature, inexperienced, naive at that at that moment in yeah. time and, and, and but learning and trying to evolve as, as characters and personalities. Yeah. I remember actually the O two World Cup, obviously you'd missed the tournament due to injury, but I remember you doing punditry, I think it was on ITV yeah. at the time. Um, in terms of what you're doing now, given that you're you know, you're on T V every week, was that a kind of helpful exercise for yourself then obviously taking it on about a decade later to working on Sky? It was a big moment that for me, I think, in terms of obviously uh, well, big moment in many ways. One missing the World Cup was a huge disappointment. But then, being asked by ITV to come into the studio, and it, I, you know, I worked in on those games in that tournament with Des Lynham, who was a genius, with Terry Venables, Bobby Robson, and Gaza, and me. They, that was the panel. So what a panel that is in terms of you know two great managers. Gaza was a great personality and character, and me is really a young professional who's still playing. Uh, 26, 27 years of age, and that was the first point where I thought, actually, I, I, I can do this, which is you, you need to be able to think that you can do something, and also I actually like it, and I should keep my options open around what I do at the end of my career. So I always did media interviews during my career with as much as I possibly could. There were some organisations I didn't really want to speak to, so I didn't do, but generally I did most TV interviews and most of the media stuff after games, particularly when I became captain. Um, we had constant radio, magazine and internal uh, television channels at Manchester yeah. United who were constantly wanting content and demanding interviews. So you just got to the point whereby you became more comfortable. I actually started doing cold commentary for the youth team games on MUTV. So my first cold commentary experiences were whilst I was still playing at the club yeah. for the MUTV for the youth team. So I did quite a lot of media work uh, at the club and then after, you know, about a year before I finished playing, Sky said to me, we want you to come and be a pundit here. Uh, and you know, I've not looked back really, I've enjoyed the last five or six years. I need to evolve in the next five or six years. I've gone from being pundit, commentator, now starting to do a little bit more of interviewing and a little bit more things that lead towards, I'm certainly not a presenter by any stretch of the imagination, I can't present yet, and maybe never will be able to, but I do want to grow in the role uh, of, 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 of being someone who can start to um, you know, ask questions and, 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 and do things better than I do now. So Monday Night Football pushes you that way a little bit, so does Friday Night Football, and I need to grow into this in the next few years and get better at what I'm doing. Yeah, and I suppose finally, obviously, we're, we're here for Premier League launch. Um, maybe just to touch on Man United and their summer. We're talking on transfer deadline day. By the time this goes out, probably we'll find out exactly yeah. who United may or may not have signed and probably may not have signed. Um, are you surprised by the negative kind of vibes that are coming from Mourinho in the public sphere um, about the season? Because they're not United, I know, like they finished 19 points behind City, but it's not like they're very, very far behind, you know, or maybe are they that far behind? Well, they finished second last season, yeah, they had a lot, many points behind, but 
like it's not all doom and gloom. No, I think that this pay, the pitch that's being painted is one that I think, to be fair, Jose through challenging the board in pre-season to get the transfers in. And I think people have jumped upon that. And, you know, we're in the media, we're, we're both in the media. If your manager gives you a, a li- gives you an inch and gives you that sort of feeling that there's a tension there, then you're going to go and push that button and push that button and push that button. So every interview he goes into, he's going to get asked the same questions. You know, what's happening, Jose, with the board? What's happening with the, t- the signings? What's happening with... And he's just continually fed them. He's fed them. Yeah. And I think he's felt as though he's needed to do that. To challenge the board to be yeah. able to get them because they're, they're obviously not performing the way in which he wants them to do, which is to get the players in. That's not me criticising the board, but Josie feels though he's needed to do that to actually put pressure on the board. There's a bit of a contrast there, though. I don't think Alex Ferguson would have done that um, in terms of like it seemed that there was a unity between the board and himself. And if there were issues, yeah, we'd never find out about it. Absolutely, and I don't think at the moment there can be a full alignment. Mm-hmm. There can't be, or else he wouldn't be. Yeah. You know, if Josie was happy, he'd be telling us he's happy. He's not. Yeah. So there isn't an alignment at this moment in time in thinking. Uh, or what the below board, what what Josie believes the board should have delivered or promised to deliver, maybe I don't know. But the reality of it is, at this moment in time, and the board are, uh, are being pointed, the, the finger is being pointed at them from the manager in terms of you know you should be bringing me in players. Yeah. And I suppose the final question before we let you go: um, City are obviously favourites, or Liverpool, the club you expect if City falls short, Liverpool are the ones maybe most likely to profit from that. Oh, I hope not. Uh, well, <laughs> oh, I hope not. I, I mean, let's, hope not. let's. I mean, Anna, let's let's, let's I just. Agree. Yeah, I mean, let's be let's be clear. Here. I mean, no, they could absolutely be. They've they've no doubt that they they get stronger and stronger. They've on paper looked like they've had a really good pre-season in terms of signings and other such things. So no, it looks like they could be the strongest contender. But I still think Manchester United at this moment in time should be the second should be the strongest contender to Manchester City. You know, just because Manchester United haven't quite signed the players that the manager wants, I don't think we could let Manchester United off the hook and just say, well, let's we'll write right this season off. That would be that would be wrong of us to, to, to do that. Yeah, and I suppose a very final question, actually, just Niall, our cameraman, is making the point about the 3-2... Uh, the first time I've ever heard a cameraman speak during an interview that I've been <laughs> I have to say, it's, easy, it's a bloody unique experience, that. I mean, the cameraman's answering the questions with me. Look, Incredible stuff. I, I have different standards here, so uh, we'll, we'll work away with this. I don't think you should edit that out. I mean, it was actually quite a good I'm actually, answer. I'm planning to leave it in. Yeah, I was going to reference him. He was, he was talking about yeah. Liverpool not winning the league, which I thought was quite apt. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was making the point, actually, just before we spoke to you, about the uh, United's comeback win over City last season and um, obviously the gap not being that huge in terms of like we've seen glimpses of what Man United are capable of Pogba obviously Mm. came good in that game what does Mourinho have to do from your point of view to get the best out of him because we saw in the World Cup he grew into that it looks like the the biggest thing will be the uh, playing of three in midfield and releasing him a little bit further forward where last season he did play in a two quite often which means there is a lot more space to cover there is a lot more expectation on your defensive responsibility whereas with a three he can be a little bit more free he can be a little bit more uh, he can empty midfield a lot more and go and chase the ball like he does and go and, go and um, uh, move into different spaces in different areas of the pitch um, I think that's what he did with France in the summer. He had uh, Kante and Matuidi always supporting him from behind, yeah. meaning that he could move forwards with the security that he had that midfield still occupied, which is critical in football. And I think that um, Jose now with Fred and Matic or Herrera will meet, make make sure that the two of those are always back there yeah. to ensure that if you know, Paul Pogba has gone wandering forward and trying to influence the game from an attacking so point cover. of view, that there is cover that he doesn't have to sprint back 100 miles an hour to get straight back in. If you play in a two and you go forward, you've got to get straight back in quickly. Yeah. Whereas you should do in a three. But we know Paul Pogba doesn't quite get back in quickly. That's not a criticism, it's just the way he plays the game. Yeah. Gary Neville, thanks Thank a million for your time. Well done.